Then he sat on his bed and laughed in a silly drunken fashion while the kitten lapped and lapped at the milk as if it would never leave off. And in the eyes of the kitten, the dirty drunken man, with his silly drunken chuckle, was a messenger of infinite mercy. That's a quote from A Kitten in Paradise by Cicely Hamilton. Born 1872 in Paddington, London. Died 1952 in Portugal at the age 80. Welcome to the Literary Cat Cast, dedicated to the preservation of writings with well-developed cat characters in world literature. I'm Phoebe Phillips. <coughs> Cicely Hamilton. She was born Cicely Mary Hamill, later changing her name to Hamilton. She's fascinating and a major contributor to many of the rights and options we have available to us today. I encourage you to do an internet search. She is pretty phenomenal. She was an English writer, journalist, playwright, suffragist, and feminist, an integral player and shaper for women in the UK and the US. Her best-known play, How the Vote Was Won, sees a male anti-suffragist change his mind when the women in his life go on strike. She founded and was involved in many leagues, unions, and organizations for women. Her influential book, Marriage as a Trade, 1909, was an important contribution to changing the perspective of women and about women. In it, she argues the point that women were brought up to look for success only in marriage, and this severely damaged their intellectual development. She followed the success of this book with a second novel, Just to Get Married, 1911. This book explores the degrading scheming of the heroine to ensnare a husband. There's a lot to say about the contributions of Ms. Hamilton, which is why I encourage you to internet search her. She deserves awareness and to not be lost in time, which is... Uh, somewhat what this podcast is about anyway. Now to the cat story, A Kitten in Paradise. It's one of 21 tales in the anthology Puss in Books, edited by Elizabeth Drew and Michael Joseph, copyright 1932, by Dodd, Mead, and Company, New York. I ordered it where I order all of my books, from Abe Books. The story uses the word gaol, G-A-O-L, gaol which means jail. I found that really interesting, the old English. I have to tell you, I should post a photo of my bookcases. Every Sunday night, I tell myself, I will not order another book this week. And six days later, by Saturday night, another book has arrived. I don't know. I think I have a problem. It's called books. Most of my books do come out of England, and I seek signed first editions to help at least build a credible collection. What I'm finding with this anthology, Puss in Books, the whole anthology, is there's usually no research available on the particular cat story I'm reading. However, there's a lot of history to be found about many of the authors. So here's what I've concluded. Michael Joseph, one of the editors and creators of Puss in Books, was an English author, journalist, and editor. He published a lot of authors through his publishing company. He was in tune with the literary scene at the time and friends with most of the influential writers of those times. So Michael Joseph also loved cats and had a famous Siamese cat named Charles. His fondness for cats led him to publish anthologies and other writings about interesting cats and their owners. I believe he reached out to these writers that were popular at the time and asked them to contribute to his anthologies. Being that they are short stories about cats, they are not deemed important enough to be in the author's biography, such as here with Cicely Hamilton. There's not one writing that ties her to this cat story except for this anthology. So now I think this podcast has even a greater mission. It's finding these authors and their cat stories. After reading about Ms. Hamilton... I can see that a kitten in paradise reflects her heart. It reflects her hope. 
this story rings out the heart with sweetness. In fact, it took me over ten times to read it for this episode, as my voice would become tearful with the ending. Now don't worry, it's not sad at all. So it's, it's not going to depress you. It's not sad. It's actually so sweet, it brings tears to your eyes. It's a portrayal of what I think we all hope to see in the world. Kindness to the most invisible, the tiny, and the helpless. And with that, let's get on with the story, which means I can hear my tea kettle. I'll be making a cup of Earl Grey. And the kittens, Pids, and Grayson have just finished a big game of chase behind me. It's time for the cat cast. A Kitten in Paradise, written by Cicely Hamilton. Taken from the anthology Puss in Books. Copyright 1932 by Dodd, Mead, and Company, New York. Edited by Elizabeth Drew and Michael Joseph. Read by Phoebe Phillips. Once upon a time, there lived in a thoroughly disreputable street, a thoroughly disreputable man. That is to say, he lived there when he was not in Gal, for he went very often and deserved to go very much oftener. In the prison he was supported by the taxpayer's money, and out of prison he supported himself by annexing other people's property. In fact, he stole so much and so often that if he had not wasted the proceeds in drink, he ought to have been quite well off. It happened one day as he was returning home from a neighboring public that he leaned against a lamp post till the street grew a little more steady, and as he stood embracing the stem of the lamp post, he heard a plaintive noise at his feet. It was the cry for help of a kitten, strayed and hungry, a small shabby kitten, very young and inexperienced. Otherwise, it would hardly have appealed for help to anyone so unprepossessing as the drunken, disreputable thief. The drunken thief was in the foolish, cheerful stage of intoxication, so the kitten's plaintive crying amused him. Hello, he said. And what have you got to grass about? Got a thirst on your air? And the pub's all shut. Uh, perhaps they've turned you out of your pub. Same as they turned me last night. The idea amused him so much that he picked up the kitten and stuffed it in his dirty pocket. And on the way home, seeing a milk can standing outside a neighbor's door, he picked that up too and carried it off to his lodging. Here you are, he said to the kitten. Try a drop of that to stop your yowling. The kid's next door a standing treat. Then he sat on his bed and laughed in a silly drunken fashion, while the kitten lapped and lapped at the milk, as if it would never leave off. And in the eyes of the kitten, the dirty drunken man, with his silly drunken chuckle, was a messenger of infinite mercy. As it happened, however, the children, whose milk had been taken, had been watching from their window when the thief lurched off with their can and before the kitten had finished its meal, there arrived a policeman with the children's father at his heels. So, as a result of treating the kitten to a drink, the disreputable thief appeared once more in the police court, and, as his previous convictions were many, and he was wanted on one or two other accounts, he again retired into Gal at the taxpayer's expense. And being in Gal, he thought bitterly, of the cause of his latest misfortune. Ere I am, he said, ere I am in this blankety cell, and all through that blankety kitten, I'll teach it to come yowling to me for drinks. If it's angling about when I come out of this, I'll send it for a swim with a stone round its little neck. But when he came out, he saw no kitten, because though he did not know it, 
the kitten had long been dead. When its messenger of mercy went away with a policeman, it waited and hoped for his return. And when he did not come back and there was no more milk, it went out into the street to look for him. And while it ran about calling for the messenger of mercy, a motor van came round the corner very quickly. And that was the end of the shabby little kitten, except that a street cleaner swept up its body from the gutter. It died unregretted by a living creature, and the drunken thief soon forgot that it had ever existed. The time came, however, when there was also an end to the drunken thief. He died, like the kitten, very suddenly as the result of a pothouse quarrel, and also like the kitten, unregretted by a living creature and his ugly black soul, having left its body, made its way to the gate that leads into paradise and stood before Peter, in whose hand is the key of the gate. Now some of us think that it is hard to enter heaven, but that is very far from the truth. On the contrary, it is a very hard thing to keep out of heaven. For the apostle Peter, in whose hand is the key, remembers that on earth he was a liar and a coward who denied his master in his need. Therefore he is merciful even to the greatest of sinners because he himself has needed great mercy and obtained it. Also at the right hand of Peter stands the holiest of all the holy angels whose eyes are so pure that they cannot see evil and sin. There is only one reason for which the soul of a sinner is turned away from paradise, and the reason is that no one in paradise has need of him. It is the right of the blessed to have fullness of joy, and how shall the blessed have fullness of joy when those whom they love are in torment? So it happens that very few souls are shut out of heaven. When the blackest of sinners is kneeling before Peter, there will come a cry of welcome from beyond the gate, and Peter will turn his great key. Like every other soul, the soul of the drunken thief came to kneel at the judgment seat of Peter. And when Peter saw its blackness, he raised his hand for silence in heaven. For he knew that so foul and begrimed a sinner could enter only if another soul loved and had need of him. Then the hosts of heaven stealed their praises and were silent, listening for the call that did not come. And as it did not come, the holiest of all the angels veiled his face for pity. And Peter, when he had waited in vain, said, You cannot enter, since no one in heaven has need of you. But even as he said it, the holiest of all the angels raised his head and called, Listen! And when Peter listened, lo, he heard a very tiny little cry. Then as the black soul looked up from its uttermost despair, the key was turned and the gate was opened. And there stood on the threshold a kitten. For to the kitten, the black soul, befouled with many sins, was more glorious than the shining ones who looked upon the face of their father. It loved the little angels, its playfellows in paradise. But the black soul had saved it in the night of its hunger and despair. So when it heard the little angels talking of the infinite mercy of God, its eyes would grow very round and wise, as it thought, I know all about that and it pictured the Lord of infinite mercy in the likeness of a drunken thief. Then Peter said, You may enter, since one of the blessed has need of you. But the black soul shrank from the open gateway and covered his face with shame, remembering how when he sat in his cell he had planned to drown the kitten with a stone round its little neck. So he cried, No! No, I am not worthy, and turned toward the place of outer darkness. 
than the holiest of all the angels, whose eyes are so pure that they cannot see sin, barred the way to outer darkness with his wings, and he spoke the will of infinite mercy to the soul that knew itself unworthy. Until you came, heaven was not heaven to a child of God. Without you, it cannot know the fullness of joy. The Lord has need of you to make glad the heart of his kitten. And once again, Peter said, Enter. And this time the black soul drew nearer. Then the kitten rejoiced and was exceedingly glad, and it marched in front of Peter and purred with its tail straight up. And it called to the angels, See who comes here, see who comes here, very proudly. While the angels bent low to the kitten as it passed, because it had saved a soul alive. But the kitten thought that they bowed in reverence to the man who was like unto God, and the black soul followed through the gate of heaven on his knees. And the hosts of heaven, like the kitten, rejoiced and were exceedingly glad. The End The Literary Cat Cast is here to rescue vintage cat literature that may be lost forever in time. This story was very difficult for me to read. In the intro, I mentioned probably 10 attempts, but actually it was much more than that. I eventually had to break it up and record it only one paragraph a day. As I mentioned, it's not sad, it's not depressing, but it does squeeze the heart because it's filled with much hope and promise for all of us. Imagine the great lie that would shine on the world if each of us helped one little thing that needed a human's help. Just one. It gives me purpose to find these stories for you, to log them into history, and commit them to the modern form of a podcast using the best recordings possible. That said, I have a new mic. I worked with a sound engineer at Sweetwater in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He listened to raw recordings of my voice and determined the Shure SM7B mic to be my best fit. And I hope this change gives you, the listener, an even better experience. This podcast has helped me develop a new skill. And the more I read, the more I'm convinced that it's not work done in vain. And a side note about the mic. The Shure SM7B is the mic that Michael Jackson recorded the song Thriller on, so I hope it really works for the podcast. It's not fair to close this episode without mention of the artwork. The illustration for this story was done by A.R. Whelan, Albertine Randall Whelan. She was born 1863 in San Francisco, died 1954, in Litchfield, Connecticut. She was a famous American illustrator and cartoonist. She illustrated all the works in this anthology, Puss and Books. I've posted the illustration on the episode page of the literarycatcast.com site. Now that you've heard the story, I encourage you to go take a look at the sketch, because it's beautiful. I thank you greatly for listening, if you feel like it. I would enjoy reading your comments in the reply section of this website, theliterarycatcast.com. While there, you can surf around and read the bios of the cats. We live with four cats at home and three cats in our studio. Yes, uh, you heard that right. <laughs> we have seven cats, all loved and all in great need of love and a home. I'm also attaching into the show notes for this episode my blog post, A Case for Siblings, about cats, not people. The meows heard in this episode are from Tilly Sue. She's the most vocal of the seven, so she's becoming the podcast rock star. Now wait for her final meows. And remember, if given the opportunity, help the little things. I'm Phoebe Phillips. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.